Alright guys, we're back looking at the green cards, and of course before we need to uh, even start looking at them, we need to talk about green in general. And the general consensus is that green is, um, if not unplayable, very bad in Battle for Zendikar. Um, definitely by far the worst color in Battle for Zendikar. I'm of the opinion that it's not unplayable, I think that's a false statement, but it is quite bad. There's just tons of commons and uncommons that are not great, they just can't keep up with the blue and red decks and they get run over very easily. Um, green does have also a lot of powerful things going for it, but I think, and we're going to see probably the same problem here is that Green specializes in big creatures and fatties and getting them out quickly. But the problem is that this is a set with lots of colorless things that do the same thing. So every color technically has access to these big colorless fatties, which is something that green's supposed to be doing. So green just kind of does its own thing while all the other colors do their own thing in addition to what green's already doing. So I think green really has to pull its own weight somehow. It has to be unique and it has to be different because people are going to have all these colorless cards that do pretty much the same thing as your green cards do anyway. Canopy Gorgers a very good example of this. So this is um, a functional reprint of a card we saw very recently in Cons of Tarkir, I believe. Tusk Colossodon was that card's name. But a 6 mana 6-5. Six, um, and maybe the mana cost is a little different, I don't know. But a uh, 6 mana 6-5 six, with just no ability. So a big vanilla creature. Um, obviously, the only time you really play something like this is if you just didn't draft a game ender. Like, you, you, need, you have a deck that kind of has a lower curve and you need something that has a little bit of oomph. Uh, maybe you've got a bunch of lower cards but you have trouble pushing in a really big threat later in the game. Then you might be tempted to play something like Canopy Gorger because honestly this sort of effect is very um, middling. It's just not that good. Um, six mana for a six six is not really that much better than something like a five mana five five. Um, after you get past 5 mana, like you, you really want your cards to be doing something very impactful. But this highlights exactly what I was just saying. There are tons of colorless creatures that are around the same mana cost and the same power and toughness that you could just slot in any deck, whereas this is going to force you into green. Like You're not going to play this in anything that's not a green deck because of the mana cost. So Canopy Gorger doesn't do anything unique for green that other decks won't have, so... The idea is why play green when I can have this sort of thing with upside in any other deck alongside better cards. And as we go on, you're going to see I don't really love the commons in this set for green. I don't think they're that great, but um, there are a couple standout cards, so we'll give them each their own due. But uh, yeah, Canopy Gorger, pass on this unless you need a big fatty. If you have something like a Ruin Processor or another 6-7 mana colorless creature, you don't really need Canopy Gorger in your deck. It's just not that great. Alright, Elemental Uprising is a 2 mana instant, kind of a interesting ability. Target land you control becomes a 4-4 four, four elemental with haste until end of turn. It's still a land, it must be blocked this turn of able. So there are a couple different app applications for this card. First off, it is an instant, so you can use it as a combat trick. Making a 4-4 four, four for 2 mana is uh, kind of like flashing in a big creature that's just going to gobble up something your opponent controls. Um, so I like use this as a pseudo removal spell. I will consider it something like that because there are just so many creatures early in the game um, that are going to die to a surprise 4-4. Four four. And uh, a lot of people won't really know this card exists because it just doesn't seem like it's going to be around um, in everybody's deck. But uh, a couple other things going for this. The fact that that land must be blocked means if your opponent's keeping back something like a 3-3, three, three, they're keeping some creature back, you can use this to eat up that creature too, which is why I say it's kind of like a removal spell. If you just bash it with a 4-4 four, four that has to be blocked, it's probably going to trade for something, and it does that for 2 mana, which is quite good. Granted, you have to have an untapped land, so really this kind of costs 3 mana if you're using it um, as a, an a spell on the offense. Um, same for defense. If you want your land to be blocking, this is really a three mana spell since you need to pay two plus have an untapped land to actually attack or block with. Um, one more interesting thing that this can do, and it's kind of a quarter case, but I see it coming up, is that you can target a land that's already been awakened, so or um, a land that's been 
triggered to have counters on it and has become a man land of some sort. Um, those lands, they're zero zeros with three one one counters on it. So what this does is it overwrites the zero zero with a four four and essentially makes that land a seven seven, which is quite strong for two mana. Um, again, Elemental Uprising does not really impact the board, but if you're used it in a way that it can function as a removal spell, then it kind of makes up for that. Um, so you need that. This is a this is interesting because it seems like a strategic card. You're going to need to know when to play it on offense or when to play it on defense. And I think it's got kind of the surprise factor going for it. So I like it as a green instant combat trick, even though it won't always function that way. Moving on, lead by example. In my opinion, this is a terrible card, but we'll see how it plays out. Two mana, instant support two. So if you have two creatures, you can put a 1-1 counter on two creatures of your choice. Um, if you only have one creature, you can choose that one. But two mana for one counter is awful. Two mana for two counters on different creatures is still not that great. If this could put... I hate support the fact that it can't put multiple counters on the same creature. Um... But I think this card is awful. Like, it just doesn't do that much. It's not like Tandem Tactics. Sure, the 1-1 one, one counters are permanent, but Tandem Tactics gave plus 1, plus 2 to two separate creatures for the same cost, plus a life gain to boot, and it was quite the blowout card. Lead by example, I don't think is going to be as much of a blowout, as there is a pretty big difference between 1-1 one, one on two creatures than um, plus 1, plus 2 on two creatures. Um, so take what you will from this card, but my opinion is don't play this. I don't think it's that good. Um, uh, I could be wrong. Maybe adding that two extra power to the board is worth it, but, uh, I'm going to be passed on this very, very often. All right, Loam Larva is a 2 beta 1-3. When it enters the battlefield, you can search your library for a basic land, reveal it, shuffle your library, and then put that card on top. This does not put the land into your hand. Um, very, very similar. In fact, exactly the same as Inoc Guide's second ability, um, which turned out to be a little more playable. Of course, Inoc Guide was more flexible of a card because you could always have it coming as a 2-2 if you didn't need that effect, whereas Loam Larva doesn't have any alternative it is a 1-3 for 2, which is not very good. So you want this ability, and I think when you want this ability is when you are splashed a third color. If you're just a solid two-color deck and you don't have any third color, I don't think you need Lobe Larva just to make sure you're hitting land drops, just because this is a terrible top deck later in the game. But if you need a third color, and maybe you have one or two sources, or if you need something that can search out the... Um, wastes in your deck if you're playing that sort of deck well larva does a pretty good job of that but keep in mind that it does not actually put that land into your hand it simply puts it on top of your deck so if you use this ability you know for a fact you're drawing a land for the next turn which could be good or bad depending on the situation <laughs> all right natural state um is a one mana instant destroy target artifact or enchantment with converted mana cost three or less now this is always a nice type of card to have in your sideboard in case you need it it does actually hit all of the artifacts in oath of the gatewatch i'm not sure about um battle for zendikar off the top of my head but i believe it hits most artifacts and enchantments uh, a couple things that it does not hit that are worth noting are um isolation zone or isolation whatever the four mana white um, enchantment we saw that is kind of like stasis there it doesn't hit that it doesn't hit um retreat to emiria and it doesn't hit dampen and pulse just to name a couple enchantments that are actually pretty problematic that you would want your naturalize effect to hit so this is lacking in that department what it does hit are the other um retreats which in my opinion aren't that great it hits um a couple blue and black kind of pacifism type enchantments which are okay and it does hit artifacts if your opponent is playing equipment or they have it in a deck where the equipment seems to be threatening you then you do have natural state to kind of deal with that this is a last pick card you're going to be kitting it very very late in the pack um just because there aren't that many threatening artifacts or enchantments and this still has a stipulation on it anyway so don't go taking this um you are probably going to get it when you need it which is like last three cards of the pack i imagine all right netcaster spider is actually a reprint i'm pretty happy to see here just because flying is a pretty strong deck in this format uh blue white flyers is very competitive um 
but that caster spider is a 2-3 with reach, and if it blocks a flyer, it gets plus 2 plus 0. So it blocks flyers as a 4-3, which is very good. Um, that caster spider, I believe, was in M15 last, and it played a very big role there where flying was relevant there as well. Um, but that caster spider just does a better job at blocking flyers than cards like Giant Mantis, which is a 2-4 reach. This just trades with bigger cards, and the 3 toughness means that it's actually going to survive a lot of things. It's probably going to lock down the air for the first couple turns that it's out. It's going to make your opponent very very reluctant to attack with big flyers and it just threatens to gobble up things not to mention that it's already a decent blocker on the ground in addition to that so it kind of does a very good job on defense not a particularly um, great card on offense but you're really not playing it to fill that role <laughs> Alright, 3 mana instant, Pulse of Marasa. This card returns a land or creature you control from your graveyard to the owner's hand, and you gain 6 life. And I should say um, a land or creature from any graveyard to its owner's hand, so that does have applications in 2-headed giant where you can gain 6 life for your team and also choose your partner, get them a creature back or a land back from their graveyard. Um, in 1v1, where you're going to be playing this most often, I don't think this really does that much. If you're against an aggressive deck, that 6 life could be just very, very clutch. And it also kind of lets you aggressively trade off a creature early, as you can get that creature back. The land clause is um, pseudo-relevant, but you'll be using it for a creature more often. I'm not a big fan of regrowth type effects that let you get just like one card back from your graveyard, as it doesn't really net you cards. There are times you want this, but I think if the times that you want Pulse and Marasa are going to be the times where the 6 life is very relevant. So my opinion is keep this in the sideboard, except against very, very aggressive strategies, in which case um, maybe one copy is okay, but never more than one copy, and altogether I think the card is just not that great. Alright, is this Lagak? I have no idea how to pronounce that word, but I'm going to call it Saddleback Lagak, um, which sounds stupid when I'm saying it, but uh, yeah, how, what, what is a Lagak? I have to look that up. Anyway, this is a 4 mana 3 one, so way, way behind curve on the power toughness range, but um, when it enters the battlefield, you support 2. Uh, okay, what should we say about this? Remember, I said if you watch my other videos, I'm not a big fan of support unless you can get the most value out of it possible. If you are supporting two, if you have two other creatures when you play this and they each get a counter, you paid four mana for five power and three toughness, which is great. And if you support one, you paid four mana for four power and two toughness spread out across different bodies. So I think this card is a little bit stronger than it looks. It just looks unappealing because I see 4 mana and I see 3 1 and I know that support 2 is uh, not always going to hit 2 creatures. Sometimes it's going to be support 1, sometimes it's just going to be a dead 4 mana 3 1 in my hand which is awful. So Saddleback Lagak gets my vote is kind of a skeptical pick. If you have a very very creature heavy deck or you're making tons of scions then I think this card is definitely worth the value as add in 5 power for 4 mana is very good. But if you're not reliably getting the full support out of this, then I think it's a passable card. Tajuru Path Warden is a 5 mana 5 4 with Vigilance and Trample. It is an ally, an elf as well. There are quite a few elves here, which is not irrelevant. Um, but yeah, this is a solid card. Um, I think it's much better than the Canopy Gorger we started with, the 6 5. Yeah, it's a. You know, one power toughness less for one less mana, but Vigilance to Trample is good. This means it can attack and block quite well. Your opponent's probably going to have to trade something very relevant or trade a couple creatures for it. It's going to trample through Chump Balkers, so if your opponent's not in a very good state, this card starts just trampling over them, literally trampling over them. And Vigilance and Trample are a nice little mix. It means it's good on offense and decent on defense. So I think this is a solid card for green, um, especially considering I haven't seen that many um, very exciting green commons yet. I think this card is a lot higher on the list than most of the other ones. Speaking of cards I'm not very high on the list of, we have Vines of the Recluse. This is a 1 green, so it is pretty efficient. Um, instant speed, target creature gets plus 1, plus 2, and gains reach until end of turn, untap it. Yeah, that definitely has value. It's good against flyers. It does untap a creature, and it does give a pretty sizable boost. Um, the toughness here means that your creature is likely to survive in most cases. I don't like this card, though. I, I don't think it's that great. Is it worth a whole card? It is super efficient. 
Um, green's not really the color of Surge, though. Um, it is super efficient, it is instant speed, and it deals with flyers, but there's already a good number of reach creatures in this format that I don't think we really need to devote a bad combat trick, or a we don't need to devote a slot in our deck to a bad combat trick if we have cards like Netcast or Spider in our deck. Now, if you didn't get there on the reach creatures and you just are getting stomped by flyers, having something like this is great, but... um. I think Plummet is a better sideboard card to deal with fires than something like this. As just a combat trick, plus one, plus two, and untap is very unexciting, even though there are times that that sort of effect will catch your opponent off guard and it'll be decent. For one green mana, that means that you can almost always leave this up, but um, there are times when plus one, plus two just isn't enough to justify a card. Stalking Drone is a two mana, two, two, with the void. And for a colorless mana, Stalking Drone gets plus one, plus two until end of turn. You can only activate this ability once per turn, though, once on your turn, once on your opponent's turn. So this is very similar, um, but albeit a little bit different than um, Snap and Gnarled. Snap and Gnarled was two mana, two, two, with Landfall plus one, plus one. So they're very similar in that they rely on your lands to kind of make them aggressive threats, but they have a base of a 2-2 power creature for 2 that has the potential to start attacking for 3 on turn 3. So, Snap and Gnarly kind of falls off when you're not missing your lands, whereas Stalking Drone requires a tiny mana investment, but has a more reliable pump than Snap and Gnarly. If you don't hit your land drop for the turn, Snap and Gnarly just a 2-2, whereas if you have that uh, colorless source, this can always be a 3-4. So this starts getting in damage quite early, which I think is what green needs to be competitive in this format. These cards just, they're not doing that much. They're not doing anything impressively different than the other colors. Red is just so much stronger of a beatdown color than green is in this format. But cards like this might be what green needs to stay ahead of the game, or at least to do what green needs to be doing, and that is dealing chunks of damage to your opponent. It's not like your opponent's going to be able to play something on turn 2 that blocks this very well. How many things deal with a 3-4 on turn 2? Um, not very many. So Stock and Drone is a fine card. It does require that mana investment, so it's not completely free, but it is definitely what green needs as a 2-drop, and I think it's a playable card. Scion Summoner, probably, this is the last common in the green video, and it's probably my vote for best green common in the set. Um, I don't see anything that really kind of stands out, but Scion Summoner is a pretty standard card. You have three mana for a 2-2, two -two, and when it enters the battlefield, you get a Scion out of it. So three mana for a total of three power and three toughness. Three mana three threes are great and limited. That's kind of the... Um, epitome of the vanilla test if you can start getting three power and toughness on board for three mana that for some reason is that much better than a two two for two and a little bit better than a four four for four in my opinion um, three mana three threes are great and this spreads it out across two bodies so you can use that scion however you would use any other scions ramp it ahead so on and so forth but yeah this is no nesting drone or anything like that but I think it's good enough um, it slots very nicely into the green decks from Battle for Zendikar, which were lacking very good three drops, but I think Sound Summoner is a very good three drop, and I think you're going to play as many of them as you can get. Okay, moving into the uncommons, and unfortunately we're starting with an uncommon that's borderline unplayable, except in very, very niche situations, but Bonds of Mortality is two mana, enchantment when it enters the battlefield you draw a card and then it has an activated ability for green mana your opponent's creatures lose hexproof and indestructible until end of turn very interesting obviously this seems more for like edh and constructed and so on and so forth it does replace itself but honestly you're not really using this ability very often in limited so just playing a two mana draw one doesn't really do anything um, so this card is super cuttable. I do like that it interacts with Make a Stand. Um, on the surface, at least, it seems like it does, because Make a Stand gives all of your opponent's creatures indestructible, so if you let this happen, and then you trigger the ability, they'll actually lose that indestructible. The problem is, this is an enchantment, so your opponent sees it. There's no way they're going to run their Make a Stand into the battlefield if you just have the green to take away their indestructible. So it's kind of a hit-or-miss situation. Maybe you 
hot your bond somewhere and hope they don't realize that it has that ability. But uh, yeah, bonds of mortality, um, highly unplayable, except in situations where you just can't deal with a certain hexproof creature. If your opponent's playing something like the 7-6 Trample Hexproof from Battle for Zendikar, then sure, board this in, but don't main deck it. And, in fact, you probably don't want it in most situations. There aren't that many indestructible and hexproof things you have to deal with in this format. All right, this one, however, is fantastic uncommon. This is the mirror pair for the Embodiment of Fury that we saw in red. This one costs one more, so it's five mana instead of four, and you get a 4-4 four, four instead of a 4-3. This one is essentially the same thing, but replace the word trample with vigilance. So you get a 4-4 four, four vigilance, your land creatures have vigilance, and when you play a land, you can trigger landfall and make one of your lands a 3-3 three, three until end of turn. And that 3-3 three, three will have vigilance if Embodiment of Insight is still on the field while it's attacking. The thing is, um, vigilance for land creatures is much, much, much better than trample. Trample on 3-3s three is okay. It just doesn't really become relevant too, too often. The thing is, vigilance on land creatures allows you to attack with those creatures and then still have them available as lands to tap for mana in the second main phase or on your opponent's turn. Vigilance is not something you see often on green cards, and I say that in spite of the fact that we actually just saw a green card with vigilance in the commons, but this is very powerful. Um, the fact that it lets you get value, just like the other one, everything I said about that card, I can say about this one. But I think this one's even better, just because of how relevant Vigilance is on land creatures. Um, <clears throat> so it seems like Green Red is still geared towards the landfall deck, and these two embodiments, if you can pair them together, it's actually extremely good. If you have them both on the battlefield, then one land to enter in the battlefield lets you turn uh, two lands into six power and toughness with Trample and Vigilance, that's just incredible. But Embody of Insight gets my vote as one of the best uncommons in green, um, if not in the set. <laughs> Seed Guardian, alright, so the Green Giant is a 4 mana, 3, 4 with Reach. That's actually a very nice mix of abilities. Reach is relevant in the set, 3, 4 is strong and lets you kind of take down flyers or at least hold them off if nothing else. And 4 mana is reasonable for those two things together. Seed Guardian has an additional ability on death. When it dies, you get an XX green elemental creature onto the battlefield where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. Now this is usually not going to be that amazing. You don't expect to get some... Um, Big 10-10. It only counts your graveyard, so it's not your opponent or partner or anything like that. And honestly, by the time this is dying, unless you're playing it on like turn 10, in which case it's not really doing that much, you're probably not going to have that many creatures in your graveyard. Also consider the fact that there's a lot of exiling going on in this set, so creatures tend to go to the exile zone instead of the graveyard anyway. So, Seed Guardian's not really going to make a huge elemental that often. However... It still makes something. If you can get even a 1-1 one, one on this when it dies, you're getting some sort of value off Seed Guardian, and it means your opponent is using some sort of kill spell or trading some sort of creature, and you're still getting value off your Seed Guardian. So I think this card is fine. Um, I like it at Uncommon, and I think it's powerful enough to play, although I think the ability is a little misleading. If you can get something huge off of this, then go for it. I think it's awesome. But there isn't really a dedicated graveyard deck or anything like that, so I don't think the token is going to be that much of a game changer in most situations. Nissa's Judgment is kind of, I guess, uh, <laughs> an apology to players um, in that it's a decent green removal spell. Battle for Zendikar was lacking a good removal spell. It had unnatural aggression, but turns out that card didn't quite make get there very often. Um, Nissa's Judgment is sorcery speed. That is relevant, and it does cost 5 mana, so it's a little bit expensive, it's an uncommon, and it's a sorcery, which doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, it's actually quite good. It has support too, which lets you put two counters on up to two creatures, I'm sorry, one counter each on up to two creatures, and then you choose a creature your opponent controls, it does target, and each creature you control with a 1-1 counter on it deals damage equal to its power to the creature you chose, so one-sided fight basically that creature that you choose on your opponent's side of the field is not going to be dealing any damage back it does not say fight target creature you just deal damage to it which is fantastic if you have something with death touch on the field auto kill because you can just put a 1-1 counter on it with support this also i do want to point out lets all other creatures that have 1-1 counter 
word on it fight as well and I shouldn't use the word fight but you know what I mean um, not just the ones you supported so if you had other creatures on the battlefield with 1-1 one, one counters already on them you get to pile on damage this is usually enough with the two extra power and the power and toughness of the creatures you're choosing this is usually going to be enough to take down almost anything your opponent plays unless they have some absolutely gigantic creature just being able to um, imagine a situation where you have two two twos on the battlefield then you support both of them that makes them both three threes and then you're dealing a total of six damage to your opponent's creature that's actually quite good and that's not even counting any other creatures that had one one counters on them so i think nissa's judgment is highly playable it is a little bulky if you try to draft too many of them so i'm thinking two is probably the limit but green does need removal and this does a good job of it much better than unnatural aggression in my opinion <laughs> Harvester Troll. This is going to be a hit or miss card. Um, I'm a little on the fence about it, but we have a 4 mana 2-3, which is pretty awful. Um, when Harvester Troll enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice a creature or land. If you do, put two 1-1 one, one counters on Harvester Troll. So you have a little bit of versatility. You don't necessarily have to sack a creature. You can sack a land if that's something you feel like you can do. And then this is a 4 mana 4-5, four, four, which is much, much better. Um, it will set you back a land, which... Uh, depending on the build of your deck may or may not be that big of a deal and it might set you back a creature but green can make scion before turn four it can easily make an eldrazi scion so this is very easy to pull off as a uh, four mana four or five there are times where you play it and you don't want to sacrifice a land or you don't have any spare creatures to sacrifice or you're sacrificing something like a two two but i don't think sacking a two two to make this two power two toughness greater really accomplishes that much i would rather have the two separate creatures with a total power and toughness of four or five than one big threat that could get killed and then you have nothing i do like that you can sack the land though it makes it a little bit easier to pull this off without losing tempo on board or without losing a huge board presence so harvester troll is going to be good i'm, I'm going to say it's going to be good about 80 percent of the time so it's pretty decent and if i'm playing green then i wouldn't mind having one of these in my deck Bayloth Pup is a little bit odd. It's a 2 mana 3 1 in green, which is kind of some weird stats for green. And it has trample as long as it has a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. So I'm guessing the idea here is that you want to support this starting on turn 3 so that it's really just like an Alpine Grizzly. It's a 2 mana 4 2. Um, whether there are that many good support cards that are going to start doing that by turn 3, I don't know. But at the very least, this starts getting in damage in a color that needs to get in damage. I really, really hate that this is uncommon. I wish this was at common because it seems like the type of card that green just needs at common. Green, I I've said it already, but green needs to start doing damage. Otherwise, it's just sitting back with these big, dirtily vanilla creatures that aren't doing that much. And white is already doing the same thing. Red is doing the same thing. To an extent, black is doing the same thing. Um, but Bayloth Pup is fine. It just really, really need to be uncommon. It's not like this ability is pushing anything. Trample is fine. Um, but you need to get that 1-1 one, one counter on it first. So sometimes you're going to play this and it's just a 3-1 for 2, which is fine as just a base creature so the ability is upside here i'm not going to give this a huge like beating or anything because it's a fine playable card i just really wish it was not an uncommon <laughs> birthing hulk fairly decent card this is seven mana so it costs a lot um for a five four when it enters the battlefield you get two scions and then you can pay one in a colorless to regenerate birthing hulk nice little play between the two abilities here because if you tap out to play birthing Hulk, then at least those scions can be used to regenerate this thing so it's fairly safe to tap out and play this creature and hope that it's uh, not getting exiled that's one problem i have with this is that exile effects are very prevalent in the set so regeneration is a little bit worse than it would be in most sets also for seven mana you could be doing um your opponent's probably going to be playing some big things by seven two so a five four is not the most impressive granted you do get seven power total six toughness total out of this which means it's quite strong um spread out across three bodies but i would not overestimate the ability to regenerate this thing just because of how many exile effects there are in the format and um we'll be seeing one in black but we've already seen one in white and we still have cards like Scour from Existence, which are fairly relevant and um, 
yeah. So not much else I can say about that. Big green beater, a little bit behind. It's not like you're attacking with those scions too often. So a little bit behind what your opponent's going to be doing at seven mana, I think, in most cases. So I think this is a fine card. I never, never, never want more than one of these because I don't think it's that good. But I'm happy picking up one and just calling it a day in my green decks. All right, and then Ruin in their wake. I want to point out this is absolutely fantastic art. I love the art on this card. I think it's amazing. But um, what we have here is a two-mana sorcery with the Void. Search your library for a basic. You can reveal it. I'm sorry, you can put it on the battlefield tapped if you control wastes. If you do not control waste, then you just put that land into your hand. So we have two very, very... Um, far ends of the scale here. First off, if you already have the waste and this goes onto the battlefield, then it's rampant growth and it's fantastic. If, however, you don't control waste, then this is two mana to put a basic from your deck into your hand, which is worse than Sylvan's Grind, and I think Sylvan's Grind is awful and limited. This does fix your mana, but it's not really the best way to do that. In fact, it's a very um, just unexciting way to fix mana, as it doesn't even ramp you it just puts it into your hand um obviously you really want to be playing this sort of effect in decks that have wastes i would say if you have uh at least two wastes in your deck then sure run ruin in their wake because there's a fairly reliable chance that when you have this card you're gonna have that waste on the battlefield but um if you're not running any waste don't use this as your way to ramp or don't use this as it, it's actually not even ramp if you're not running the waste to just make sure you're going to hit a land drop it. I don't think that's really worth an entire turn or an entire card's investment. Alright, moving into the rares, and we start off with an extremely powerful one, in my opinion. Sylvan Advocate is a 2 mana 2-3 two, with Vigilance. Fantastic base stats. This just punches through 2-2s two, all day long. As long as you control 6 or more lands, Sylvan Advocate and the land creatures you control get plus 2, plus 2. Wow, so this has extremely good light game value in a color that cares about those land creatures more than most colors do. So, if you have the 6 lands, what are you getting? You're paying 2 mana for a 4-5 Vigilance that is going to pump all your other land creatures. Hopefully you're playing a deck that can support those other land creatures. This has a very similar effect to Dragon Master Outcast, but it's a very, very different card. Dragon Master Outcast was a one-drop that you really do not want to see on the battlefield until turn 5 or 6 when you know you're going to start getting those dragons. Sylvan Advocate is such a powerful card at 2 mana that you're happy to play this at any time, whether you have the lands or not. It's just very good on turn 2, and is very good when you get those 6 lands. So it scales in power. Your opponent's going to want to hit this with removal before you can get those lands out. Also, it is an elf and an ally, which we've seen there are quite a few of both of those things. Things. Both are relevant type lines in this. I think this is an overall very powerful card, and whether you like green or not, it's going to be very tempting to play green if you have this sort of card available to you. Oath of Nissa, this is the final oath we're going to look at. There will not be an oath in the black set. There is no black oath for this set. But, um,. Oath Nissa is one mana, super efficient, the cheapest of them all, for the legendary enchantment. Again, ignoring this Planeswalker clause, it says you can spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast Planeswalker spells. So if you draft the deck that has 20 Planeswalkers in it, by all means, go ahead and play this. But we're really looking at the first ability. When Oath of Nissa enters the battlefield, look at the top three cards in your library. You can reveal a creature, land, or Planeswalker from among them, put it into your hand, and the rest go on the bottom. So this is a... Nine, nine times out of ten, this is going to be Anticipate for green. At sorcery speed, of course, it is an enchantment, so you have to play it on your turn. But it's one mana, it filters, and it filters for things that green usually cares about. Creatures and lands. Yeah, if you had a Planeswalker, sure. But creatures and lands, green is not going to play that many enchantment or that many enchantments it's not going to play that many sorceries and instants very 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 rarely will oath of nissa miss i imagine it's going to hit um at least 90 percent of the time if not like 95 96 97 something like that but um this is an effect that's not really available to green in such an efficient way. We usually get cards like Seek the Wilds or something very similar. There's always a card like Seek the Wilds. And those cards just aren't that great because they um, dump cards in the graveyard and this isn't really a graveyard set. Or they're a little bit too narrow or they cost 
too much. The fact that this costs one means that you probably don't play too many one-drop creatures in your deck or things you want to do on turn one. And this is just going to draw you a card. It's a green cantrip for one mana, and it's going to look for something relevant. Digging is not something that green does well, but Oath and Nissa does that quite well. So this is one of the probably um, next to Jace's Oath, one of the Oaths I like most in Limited. Um, I'm not going to rank those right now or anything, but I think Oath and Nissa is a solid card for green. Zendikar Resurgent. On the flip side of what I just said, I think this has my vote for probably one of the worst rares in the set. I do stand to be corrected because um, I think half of it's bad and half of it's intriguing. It has two different effects though. First off, 7 mana enchantment that doesn't do anything right away, assuming that you're tapping out for it. 7 mana is probably going to take up your turn, and the enchantment will not affect the board immediately. Um, that's that's asking for a lot. Seven. This is a format where 7 mana gets you a huge creature that's going to start beating your face in. This really needs to justify itself on the following turn to make it playable, um, which I really don't think it is. But first off, while it's on the battlefield, if you tap a land for mana, you essentially produced another mana of... Um, any type that land produced. Notice the way it's worded doesn't say anything about colored, I'm sorry, colored mana. And in fact, it does include colorless mana in the type line. I think that was a smart move there. So you don't have to produce colored mana. If you have a waste, that waste essentially nets you two colorless mana. Or if you tap a mountain, you get two red, so on and so forth, stuff like that. Um, but it's essentially doubling your mana. Which sounds like a great effect, but you've already paid 7 mana to put this on the battlefield. Um, by the time you have those 7 lands, unless you have something like Kozilek in your deck, or a 10 drop, or a 11 drop, then I see no reason why you need to be ramping from 7 mana to 14 or 15 mana on your next turn. Um, if you have something like an X cost spell, then maybe I can see that. But I don't think uh, this was made for limited, I just don't think it's that great in limited. The second part uh, might be the saving grace of this card. Whenever you cast a creature spell, draw a card. That's a very, very powerful effect. Again, 7 mana though, you've probably cost, uh, cast most of your cheap creatures. Your hand's probably very close to empty. Um, but if you start top decking creatures, you're going to start drawing more cards, drawing more creatures, drawing more cards, etc. The thing is, drawing cards does not guarantee you win the game. A lot of people, they see a good draw engine, and they just assume that they've won the game because they have a lot of card advantage. But as 7 mana, if your opponent's got something that's rivaling this, then drawing extra cards is not going to be enough to win you the game. Um, I think this is bad. I honestly think this is a no-go, but um, I could be proven wrong. And if I do, I think it's going to be because of this second ability, not because of that first ability. I'm not going to make any bets on how good or bad this is, but my guess is that I'm going to be passing it, and I don't think it's that good. Alright, getting close to the end here, we have, I think, four more cards. Here we have Gladeheart Cavalry, so another 7-mana card. Why not just tack 7-mana on everything? Uh, not an ally. Why, why is this elf not an ally? I guess they, they like to do their own thing, but... Alright, anyway... We have a 6-6 six, six. when it enters the battlefield support 6. Now that looks very powerful. Um, this is the type of card where people look at it and they say, Wow, 7 mana for 12 power and 12 toughness. That's crazy. No, just stop right there. Support 6 means that you have to have up to 6 other creatures on the battlefield to get the full potential out of this card. Now, I'm not saying you need the full potential for this to be great. I think it's very easy to have three, maybe four other creatures on the battlefield when you play something like this. Or in certain games, yeah, you'll have the six other creatures. Eldrazi Scions are in the set, and it's very easy to get a board where you have six other creatures. I'm just saying it's not going to always be the case. But yeah, if you have three, four other creatures, pumping them up in addition to adding a 6-6 six, six to the board is huge. I think this does quite a bit for seven mana. Pumps your other creatures plus adds a big threat but we get another ability here whenever a creature you control with a 1-1 counter on it dies you gain two life so yeah this definitely justifies itself if you're getting some counter if your board is empty and you're playing seven mana for a six six i think this card uh <laughs> is not that great sometimes you'll have to do that because that's just the way the game works sometimes but hopefully you're getting a bunch of support out of this um I'm thinking, like, super bad case scenario, if you have support, if you only get to support one creature, then you're paying 7 for a 7-7, seven, seven, and then you still get value off that creature when it dies, which I think is okay, 
if on its side and, and it, uh, it it's just upside from there. The more creatures you have when you play this, the better it scales, and it definitely has a very, very high ceiling with support be six being an incredibly high ceiling that is just um, almost game-ending in some situations. All right, and the final rare is Vile Redeemer, a card I think is absolutely fantastic. Three... 3-3 three, three with Flash and Devoid. Um, if this had no ability and it was just a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three with Flash, I would already think it's great. So everything else is upside. But Flash is such a good ability, and when it's on a fairly costed, powerful body, it becomes even that much better. So this block, sometimes it just eats creatures for free, and like I said, Flash is a good way to get people out things like pre-release when people aren't completely aware of all the cards. You can just Flash in a creature and gobble something up. But what Vile Redeemer does is when it when you cast it, notice that's on cast, not when it enters the battlefield, you can pay colorless. If you do, you get a 1-1 one, one Scion for each non-token creature that died under your control this turn. So it doesn't include other Scions, it doesn't include other tokens, but say you went turn 1, turn 2, turn 3, you played maybe two creatures, and then turn 4 you have this guy available to you, and you want to kind of use that extra mana. You could just dam jam with your creatures, see if you can maneuver some trades out of your opponent, and then if they even kill one of your creatures, they trade for one of your creatures, bam, you play this for four mana instead of three, and you get a Scion out of the deal. And worst case scenario, you can always just play this as a 3-3 three, three for three, which I mentioned earlier this video, I think that's a very, very solid limited play. So Vile Redeemer just gets a check in almost every category for me. I think it's a great card in green, and I think it's very powerful. Um, even if this ability won't be turned on a lot, it's still very nice to have tacked onto a body that's already very efficient. All right, two mythics in green here. First off, we have World Breaker, which uh, fantastic art. Also, shout out for the Hallowed Fountain in the back. That looks fantastic. But this one costs seven, and we get a five-seven reach out of the deal. Also, when you cast World Breaker, you can exile an artifact, enchantment, or a land. As I've already mentioned, artifact, enchantment, not too too big. Sure, it's very nice if you hit one of those things, but. Getting a land just for casting a creature is pretty nice. If you're ramping into this and you're setting your opponent back, maybe you're hitting their splash color or something like that, that's a very good play. Other than that, it doesn't do very much. It's just a 5-7 that kind of eats up a land or maybe a more relevant card depending on what your opponent's player. And then it's just a big body. Um, is this the best thing in the world? No. Uh, it doesn't trade with like Ruin Processor, which is a 7-8 seven, for 7 and common. Um... My complaint here is that I don't think this is a mythic level card. I think it looks impressive. I think it does quite a bit, but uh, I think it could have easily been a rare. Um, let's not forget the last part, though. For two and a colorless, you can sack a land you control and then return World Breaker from your graveyard to your hand. I still don't think this pushes it into mythic category. I think it would still be kind of like a rare. Um, it reminds me kind of like... Deathless Behemoth, recursive threats that are this big are very good and limited because you can usually just replay them if your opponent kills it and your opponent's going to, um, you know, have to use removal. The thing is, uh, I've mentioned this before, but it's still relevant. There's a lot of um, exile effects in this format. So if your opponent just exiles World Breaker, then the second ability is turned off. But yeah, 5-7 reach, 4-7 with the ability to at least kill a land when it enters the Battlefield, if not something a little bit better, is a fine card. I just don't think it quite reaches mythic level category. Um, but yeah, I'm taking World Breaker every time I see it. It is a huge body and a huge threat. So, and uh, honestly, I just want a foil of this. The card looks amazing. All right, Nissa, Voice of Zendikar is the last card here for green, and obviously this is going to be a mythic. This is a mythic that deserves to be a mythic. First off, three mana planeswalkers are great. They come down super early, and they just start dominating. And the plus one does exactly what you want planeswalkers to do. You want every planeswalker to be able to do something to protect itself, and making a token is the best way to do that. Maybe not the best, but it's definitely a good way to do it. So it starts, Nissa starts plussing. Um, starting out at 3, essentially 4 if you put her up 1 the turn she comes in, and you start getting these 01 plants. Now, plants not really a creature type that matters, um, 01s aren't very relevant, but obviously the idea is you're kind of building up a little army of plants, and then you use something like the minus 2 to put a 1 1 counter on each creature. There are times where you just play Nissa and you minus 2 right away, 
making your team a lot bigger, giving some sort of anthem. But obviously, the appeal is to play in this in turn three and just start up and up and up and up and. Um, it takes a while to get to her ultimate. It is minus seven, which means she has to go for, assuming you plus one her every turn, uh, about four turns before you can even minus seven. Um, but what it does is you gain X life and draw X cards where X is the number of lands you control. And by that, you should have um, at least six, maybe seven lands, something like that. So think about it. Uh, I'm going to kind of go with a low here and here and say uh, gain five life, draw five cards. Um, that's very good for one card, not to mention you've gotten four or five plant tokens out of the deal, and in a very, very long game, you always have this option to minus two. One thing I will say about Nyssa, even though um, I think it's better than Chandra, is that in the late game, it has the potential to not be great. Obviously, you're going to build your deck with the intentions of wanting to play Nyssa on turn three, but sometimes if you're behind, Nyssa is a planeswalker that's not really going to get you back into it. She doesn't have a way to remove other creatures from the board. Think about cards like Obnixilis or Sarkin the Dragon Speaker or um, just any planeswalker that has a bounce ability anything like that um nissa doesn't have anything like that she doesn't have interaction with your opponent at all so she's just doing things on your side of the field which some most of the time is going to be good enough but um i think whereas uh nissa can really build an army early chandra can do things like wipe the board or really interact with your opponent's creatures force chump block stuff like that so there are times where nissa is going to fall flat even though i think that's going to be a very rare case um do want to point out nissa is currently slotted as the most expensive card in the set and is certainly going to see play in standard whereas chandra's kind of up in the air right now in limited i think nissa is probably overall not as powerful as chandra but definitely um cast in three instead of six is a huge huge comparison and i think it's actually probably a fault to compare the two because they're so different with such different ver uh mana costs but yeah nissa is going into my green decks whenever um it's a shame Looking after looking at all these green cards, I still don't think green got what it needed. I think it's still very weak. The commons in particular are just not getting there. And some of the uncommons could have easily been commons, which means that they're um they're just common level cards that have been printed at uncommon. So I think green, uh, right now looking at it, I think green is still the weakest color here. I don't think it got what it needed to really push it above and beyond. There are some good cards. It got a pretty good removal spell. It's got some kind of uh, corner case okay on uh, combat tricks. And it's got some pretty big creatures. But overall, it just looks unexcited. I mean... Do you all agree with me? Do you think green is doing anything different than red? I think red does everything that green does, but it just does it better and faster and more efficiently. Um, but yeah, that's my complaint with green, and uh, I'm sorry. We're sitting here looking at Nissa, which is fantastic guard, but uh, overall, I think green is just not going to get there in this set, um, which I hate to say because uh, that's kind of the rap it had in the last set, but um, there you go. That's my opinion about green. Let me know if you agree or agree or <laughs> agree or disagree. Um, let me know. Do you think green got a boost? Do you think it got even worse this time around? Let me know what you think, and uh, I'll be back with the black cards next. We have two more videos to go. The black cards, and then I'm very excited about the multicolor cards. There are some really uh insane effects in the multicolor cards but um i'll be back with the black video probably tomorrow and i appreciate you guys watching